Hello and welcome again to my physics online video lecture supplement series. In today's video I'm going to continue with the set of lectures numbered seven. So lecture set seven, energy and its conservation. And today we are going to look at the fourth part of this video series, this lecture series. And this fourth part is all about power. So, so far we have discussed work, we have discussed energy, we've discussed mechanical energy in the forms of both potential and kinetic energy, and we have discussed transforming from one type of energy to another via the conservation of energy. And we've discussed the work energy theorem, which is also a, a crucial part of these uh, concepts of conservation of energy. In today's video, I want to look more at what happens when work is done on a system and specifically at the rate change in energy or the rate at which work is done. So power is the rate change in energy of a system or you could think of it as the rate at which work is done to or by a system. So recall from our second set of lectures that velocity is a rate change in position or displacement and acceleration is a rate change in velocity. So we can therefore, by combining these two statements, give a mathematical definition for an average power and it's going to look kind of analogous to how we defined average velocity or average acceleration or average speed, etc. So the average power is defined as the rate at which work is done. So amount of work per unit time. And that is also going to be equal, therefore, to the change in energy of a system per unit time. This, of course, is the average power. For the instantaneous power, we look at this average over a very short time interval. So power is truly thought of as, as the rate at which work is or could be done by an object or system. But since work is equal to the change in energy, we oftentimes just use that power is equal to change in energy per unit time rather than work per unit time. So there's another way of calculating average power. And, and ultimately, this means that we have another way of calculating the instantaneous power. And we can approach it as follows. Work is force dotted with displacement, and that gave us F delta x cosine theta. So this is the equation that we've used before for work. So since power can be work per unit time, we can rewrite this as power equals F times displacement times cosine of theta over time, or f delta x over time times cosine of theta, which is the same as ultimately um, force times average velocity times cosine of the angle between the displacement and the force, which incidentally will be the angle between the force and the velocity. And so you can simplify that, for example, by defining the velocity as being entirely directed in the x direction uh, in, in one dimension we would say that this is the average power is the force along the x direction times the velocity along the x direction and in fact if we need to go to more dimensions then what that looks like is that the force is going to be excuse me the power is going to be force in the x direction times the component of the velocity in the x direction plus force in the y direction times component in the y direction plus force in the z direction times component in the z direction. So this equation could be expanded if we wanted more dimensions. In any case, this is an average power equation. And the only thing that we really had to average here is the velocity or the speed, if you will. So if we wanted to get an instantaneous power, another way of calculating it is force times instantaneous velocity or instantaneous speed. 
With that said, the units of power are somewhat of interest to us. In the SI system, we usually use watts. And one watt is basically a joule per second. And of course, a joule is one newton per meter, which breaks into one kilogram times meter per second squared. And then that's times another meter. And that's divided by another second. So these are the basic units that a watt breaks down into kilograms, meters squared per second cubed. In the US customary system, we basically have two options. You can either do horsepower or you can do feet pounds per second. And the conversion rate is that one horsepower is about 550 feet pounds per second. Usually this is a fairly exact definition and that's approximately equal to 746 watts. And also worth noting here is that if you look at your electric bill, among other things, you get a bill that says we're charging you whatever, 12 cents per kilowatt hour. So you're being charged by the kilowatt hour. A kilowatt is, of, of course, a thousand watts. An hour is a unit of time, 3,600 seconds. So if you have a, a thousand watts, that's a thousand joules per second, you're multiplying by 3,600 seconds. The seconds cancel and you're left with 3,600,000 joules. So the kilowatt hour is actually a unit of energy, not of power. So it's more properly called either an electric bill or an energy bill, not a power bill. All right, let's go and do some examples at this point. So this right here is a picture of the RSA Battle House Tower. It's basically the tallest building in Alabama. It's located out in Mobile. And so let's say that you wanted to climb the RSA Battle House Tower. So you've got a guy with a 70 kilogram mass. He's gonna to try to climb this thing. Um, the total height from ground to top floor, I had to look up, is about 227 meters. So suppose that this guy does this by walking or jogging, as the case may be, up the stairs at a steady speed of 1.41 meters per second with each step having an equal rise per unit run. How much energy does he need in order to climb from the ground to the top floor and how much power output is this? And then what happens if we change these answers to basically a sprint up the stairs of 6.0 meters per second? This may not be a sprint on flat ground, but going upstairs, this is pretty dang fast. Okay. So first of all, we've been given the mass. Mass is 75 kilograms. So M equals 75.0 kilograms. Uh, this right here is our change in height. So this would be delta H. So let's go ahead and say delta H is 227 meters. And he's gonna do this at a steady speed of 1.41 meters per second. Um, so we could try to include that as well. V is 1.41 meters per second. So we want to know how much energy does he need in order to do this. Um, and basically you could think of it as that the energy is going into this climbing part. So the change in energy that he has is from the energy he has at the bottom to the energy he has at the top. This right here is not changing, so we're gonna ignore his kinetic energy, um, but it'd basically be E K plus E, excuse me, plus delta E P from gravity. This one right here is not really changing, so we only need to figure out the change in energy from gravity, so that should be mg delta h. So the amount of energy that he should be expending is going to be 75.0 
kilograms times 9.80 meters per second squared times the change in height was 227 meters. So the total amount of energy that he needs is going to be given by, uh, let's see, 75 times 9.8 times 227. That much energy looks like 166,845 joules. So I'll just write that in, 166,845 joules. Okay, how much power output is this? All right, well, the average power is whatever his change in energy per unit time is. So we need to figure out what this unit time is. So for to get delta t, he's at a steady rate, steady, steady speed, that is. So we can use um, delta r over v. And specifically, we need to know his change in height divided by the y component of this, saying equal rise per unit run. So that means here's v and here's vy, here's vx, vy equals vx, and vy squared plus vx squared should be v squared. That's just Pythagorean theorem. Um, if you're a little more perspicacious, you may know that this interior angle, therefore, is 45 degrees. But in any case, if we carry out the Pythagorean theorem, this thing right here is saying that vy squared plus vy squared is v squared, and so vy times 2, uh, vy squared times 2 that is, is v squared, and so vy should be equal to v over square root 2. And if you put square root of 2 into your calculator, you will find that it's about 1.41, 1.414. So that's a nice approximation. This means that Vy is approximately one meter per second. Okay, so we're going up 227 meters at a rate of one meter per second. So delta T is 227 meters divided by 1.00 seconds. Of course, that's 227 seconds. This is in physical science, so we don't need a calculator for that. So, therefore, we can now find what the average power is. It's going to be this energy divided by this amount of time. So, I need to get myself a little bit of space to work on here. Um, so, average power is change in energy per unit time. We have the change in energy that was the 166,845 joules. And then we have the change in time, which was 227 seconds. So throw that into our calculator. And what do we end up with? Let's see, 166,845 divided by 227 gives us 735 watts. So um, this guy's pretty impressive because this is almost one horsepower. Uh, so what happens if the man is running up the stairs at a steady speed of six miles per hour? Well for one this guy is insane if he can do that. But for another we basically change the number here, this V, from being 1.41 meters per second to being 6.0 meters per second. And by making that change, we end up basically, we can now propagate that change through. So 6 divided by uh, square root of 2 is going to give us 4.24. And so our, um, this number right here basically changes to 4.24 um, meters per second. 
And as a result of that change, we now change the amount of time. Um, so the amount of time becomes delta t equals 227 meters divided by uh, uh, 4.24 meters per second. See, that should be meters per second. So let's do 1 over x. Let's multiply that by 227. And we get 53.5 seconds. So 53.5 seconds. And now our new average power is same energy as before because his mass didn't change, the building height didn't change, and gravity didn't change. So we have 53.5 seconds here. And so let's uh, basically divide the 166.845 number by that. We come out with 3,118 watts. So this guy is perhaps not Superman, but he's also no mere mortal. Maybe this guy's name is Hercules or something, or Samson, or whoever you want to pick as your favorite stronger than a normal guy guy, <laughs> because he's somehow able to generate quite a few horsepower in running up these stairs. Let's do another example with power, and this one will have both an instantaneous power and a um, average power to it. So the most powerful laser in the world at the time that I made these lectures is the Texas Petawatt. This is housed at my alma mater, the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, this laser basically is named a petawatt because it delivers one petawatt of peak power, which is about a thousand times the uh, power consumption of the entire US. So the question is, how is this possible? How do you get a peak power of one petawatt at a thousand, which is a thousand times the power consumption of the US? How do you do that? Uh, this, by the way, is a picture of sort of the front end part of the petawatt that was snapped a few years ago. Um, so let's, let's see, how can we get a petawatt of peak power. Well, recall that power on average is amount of energy delivered per unit time. All right, well, the Texas petawatt uses a typical power, let's say, of order 200 joules. So we have 200 joules being delivered. But the duration of one of their typical pulses is only, let's say, 180 femtoseconds. Um, of course, both of these figures vary a little bit, as anybody who's worked on it can say. It's actually a very good petawatt laser, but even the best uh, laser in the world that's still experimental is going to have a little bit of fluctuation. Theirs may very well be one of the best high power lasers in the world. There is some fluctuation, but we'll use these numbers, 200 joules, 180 femtoseconds. So remember that a femtosecond is equal to one times 10 to the minus 15 seconds. So this is the pulse duration. This is the time during which the energy is being delivered in a pulse, you could think of it as. So a quick calculation shows that we have 200 joules, and we're dividing that by 180 femtoseconds. Um, so that's 1.111111 times, or, or I should say divided by 10 to the 15. And so we end up with, oops, I forgot to put a minus sign in there. Let's do that again. We have 200 joules, and we're dividing it by 180 femtoseconds, which is 180 times 
10 to the minus 15. So it's like this. Now we get our number. So that's a lot of ones. Remember that we want to know how many petawatts this is. A petawatt is equal to one petawatt equals one times 10 to the 15 watts. So let's convert this thing to petawatts. Basically, that means we're going to divide by another 10 to the 15. And we get 1.111 petawatt. So the average power for a shot that does this uh, is about 1.11 petawatt. And this average power is even kind of a, a misnomer. Um, it's maybe more correct to say that the power was this because this is such a small time scale that if we're thinking in times of seconds, then this is practically an instantaneous power. Now I should add here for the sake of, of completeness, and especially in case one of my old colleagues from Texas, Petawatt, happens to watch this and say, oh, come on, you know that that's not how you calculate the power of a laser pulse. Yeah, um, peak power, oftentimes there's a little more into the calculation than just taking the energy and taking the nominal pulse duration and dividing the two. Uh, the pulse has some shape to it. Um, you, you can do, you can get a peak power, for example, from depending upon the pulse shape by taking the energy and dividing by the time and then multiplying that number by two, um, etc. These times sometimes are used to characterize a pulse, so maybe the pulse has some shape to it. So, you know, here's the peak of the pulse, and the time might be discussing this duration, it may be discussing the full width half maximum duration, uh, not the scale, but this would be like the 1 over e squared duration, for example, or the 1 over e duration. Usually it's something like 1 over e squared duration, which might be about like this, or it's full width half max. So this is sort of a rough approximation, but it gives you a sketch of how you get one petawatt of power in a laser pulse, even though the, the entire US only uses, say, a terawatt of power at a time. Okay, so I wanted to shift gears a little bit for the rest of this lecture and just talk about power consumption because I think it may be kind of interesting. And the I've already sort of mentioned that the typical electrical bill or power bill should really be called an energy bill because they're charging by units of energy, kilowatt hours. And Again, I, I did a simple conversion. If you multiply this power, a kilowatt, a thousand watts, times this time, an hour, 3,600 seconds, you end up with 3,600,000 joules of energy. And I found that most of the textbooks at the time of writing this use a ballpark of 12 cents per kilowatt hour, and that rings about true. Um, and that's the cost to the consumer for residential power consumption. You can look at your electric bill and you'll notice that it kind of varies over the course of the year. And those of you who move from one location to another, usually like one state to another, you'll notice that the price will also fluctuate a bit. Um, you know, I've lived places in, in, in some years where the power bill might be five or six cents per kilowatt hour. Other places I've seen 13, 14 cents per kilowatt hour. So it kind of depends upon where you live, what time of year it is. You know, they adjust by how much power people are using in the summer for cooling versus the winter for heating and for lighting and so on. But it's kind of interesting. Uh, this right here is sort of a breakdown of um, the U.S. fuel use, and so. 
this is we use about 37 percent of our fuel is oil 24 percent is natural gas 23 percent is coal uh, a paltry eight and a half percent is from nuclear power and then everything else is about 7.5 percent all these renewables include stuff like uh, solar power and wind power and geothermal energy and so on and so this next one is showing sort of what our actual power consumption looks like um, for total energy consumption uh, for everybody in the US whether it's residential or industrial or etc so coal is by far the largest producer of power for for our uh, country natural gas is next nuclear again paltry 20 percent um, hydroelectric is a pretty good source that's basically all the dams that we've built it's only six percent but you can only do so much with that petroleum oil is about one percent of our power consumption it's a much larger percentage if we were to go back a so this one right here to, to clarify is what we're using for fuel so that's largely um, gets involved in the transportation bar on the next slide you might be saying okay nuclear we use nuclear fuel really well think about it we, we do have a military we do have aircraft carriers which are nuclear powered we have submarines which are nuclear powered we have um, electric cars anymore which are they're not nuclear powered directly but if nuclear is being used to generate electricity which is then being used to power the car then nuclear is going into that etc so this one by contrast is the um, what are we using to actually generate electricity for um, for residential and uh, use, basically. Um, then the third bar graph is basically just showing so what percentage of the US power consumption uh, among civilian sectors are going to which uh, use. So industrial uses is about 41%, transportation. 24% commercial and residential 32% so this is like all of our manufacturing capabilities etc this is getting from point A to point B whether by bus subway train plane car whatever boat and then this is powering your house powering your office powering the classroom etc so Another kind of interesting set of uh, figures comes in from this table from the OpenStax textbook, which is showing sort of what is the power output of a variety of natural and artificial phenomenon. So um, a supernova, that's when a large star explodes, can put out a peak power of 5 times 30 uh, excuse me, 5 times 10 to the 37 watts. It's a lot of power. In fact, it's more than the typical average power output of our entire galaxy. Um, the pulsar from the Crab Nebula also puts out quite a bit of power. You can see where the sun falls on here, 4 times 10 to the 26th. This also lets you get a nice estimate for how many stars are in the galaxy, although I think this estimate will end up being off by just a little bit. Um, so moving on to more terrestrial phenomenon, there's volcanoes, there's lightning bolts, here's what a nuclear power plant does, here's what an aircraft carrier does. Notice this is only 30 times more than an aircraft carrier. Um, and sort of going down the list you get down to electric clocks, how much heat you're generating, what a pocket calculator does, etc.
So let's do a couple of quick examples using this table. The first one is how much money is it going to cost to do a load of laundry in a clothes dryer for an hour? All right, recall that the, the cost is 12 cents per kilowatt hour. So this is our cost. And now let's come over here and look for a clothes dryer. That's right here on the list. Clothes dryer says four times 10 to the three watts. So we have an average power four times 10 to the three watts. And we're looking for one hour's worth of consumption. 10 to the three watts, this right here, uh, excuse me, this part right here is equal to one kilowatt. So if we're doing four kilowatts times one hour, then that is equivalent to having four kilowatt hours. And at 12 cents per kilowatt hour, that means that we're spending a total of 48 cents to do this load of laundry. So, of course, that's not counting water, although you know what your water bill is. It's not that expensive. It tells you a little bit about what the overhead is for, oh, say, the laundromat that charges you $2 to put your clothing in a clothing dryer for 15 minutes. I kid, of course. They usually charge about 25 cents a minute, but you can see that that's maybe still a pretty steep profit. <laughs> Our next question has to do with uh, that an earlier question that I sort of asked in the previous set of lectures, which is how much energy is being produced by a gallon of gasoline? All right, you may not, um, you may be looking at this table going, okay, how am I supposed to use this table in order to estimate how much energy is produced by a gallon of gasoline? So here's where a little bit of problem solving might come in. Um, it doesn't really list what a gallon of gasoline is gonna produce, but what it does list is how much power output is there for a car, total useful in heat transfer. So the power for a car on average it's saying is 8 times 10 to the 4 watts. Now, in one hour, how far does that car go? Uh, let's say that we're driving on the highway, so let's make it uh, 60 miles or whatever. So one hour is 60 miles. And a fairly typical gas mileage for a newer car. I'm not talking anything really fancy, but I'm not talking like a truck or an SUV here. Typical gas mileage might be 30 miles per gallon highway. So this means that in one hour we burn through two gallons of gasoline. Um, and, and that's just because in one hour we've gone 60 miles, we're getting 30 miles to a gallon. So that just simply implies that we needed to use two gallons to get this far. Okay, so how much energy did we use for that hour? Well, the energy should be the average power times the time. So that's 8 times 10 to the 4 watts times an hour, which is 3,600 seconds. So let us see what we get for that. So 8 times 10 to the 4 times 3,600 gives us this number, which is basically about 2.88 times 10 to the 8 joules and then we need to divide that by 2 gallons 
And so that gives us that the energy content for a gallon is about 1.44 times 10 to the 8 joules. So now we can check, is this actually a reasonable number? So I looked this thing up in the common source, which of course we all know is the internet. And it says that a gallon of gasoline is about 124,000 BTUs. That's from the engineering toolbox that they bring up. Um, also sort of estimates that I see that something out of Oak Ridge is estimating that. So Oak Ridge is one of our national labs from the Department of Energy. Um, I'm not gonna spend 45 minutes thoroughly researching this just for a short example. Uh, the other thing that you gotta do is convert this to BTU. So again, if you type 124,000 BTU in joules into the Google search, it will do that for you. And the number that it gave me is 138.269.26 joules. So if we put in a couple of placeholder commas, this is basically saying 1.3 times 10 to the 8 joules. So not a bad comparison. And that is, again, per gallon. Uh, so looks like our ballpark estimate worked out pretty well. All right, so that's all very interesting. Um, I know that a lot of my students are some sort of bio majors, and the biology department here is constantly on my case to talk more about bio applications of all of physics. Uh, not that I go to them and ask them to talk about physics applications of all of biology, but I don't mind doing a little bit of, uh, you know, finding some interesting examples that have to do with biology. Uh, so one such example has to do with our, uh, basically how our body metabolizes food how we get energy into our system, how we get energy out of our system. So basically we eat food and that is energy input into the system. Our body breaks that down, stores it as fat or carbohydrates or what have you for energy. And then that ends up getting converted to a variety of things. So there's thermal energy. That's what regulates our body temperature, for example, my office is typically 58 degrees Fahrenheit. No, I don't get to have control over the temperature of my own office. That is actually frigid uh, to my taste. And yet, if we were to take my body temperature, it would probably be just about 98 degrees Fahrenheit on a typical day. So my body must be burning quite a bit of energy just to keep me warm in, while I'm sitting in my office. Uh, another thing we do is we can exert some effort and work. So maybe we do it by working out, lifting weights. I guess this guy lifts. Um, we can run or hike or climb stairs. Anything like that involves some amount of work. Um, just by nature, the fact that our muscles are contracting and that's a force over a distance. And then we also have some amount of internal energy that we need just to keep our heart beating and our diaphragm muscles uh, working while we breathe, etc. So this is another type of work. And then anything that we don't use for thermal energy, for work, ends up getting stored as fat. So if you eat too much pizza and you forget to lift and you're pretty sedentary, then you start packing on the pounds. And that is why I gain weight. So 
yeah, you end up uh, storing fat and fat has some energy content to it. So the rate at which your body consumes energy is sometimes called a metabolic rate. And there's quite a few things that go into that. One of them is age. Once again, this is why you get fat when you get old if you aren't very, very, very active or if you don't watch your diet. Uh, one of them is gender. Um, I suppose that men and women have slightly different metabolic rates depending upon actually a variety of factors such as how old they are. Uh, you know, a pregnant woman will have a different metabolic rate than a non-pregnant woman who will have a different metabolic rate than a new mother, etc. Um, your body weight actually determines your metabolic rate. Believe it or not, the uh, more weight you have, the higher your metabolic rate tends to get. And actually, the more muscle mass you have, the higher your metabolic rate. So people who are sort of athletes or very muscular people, are going to have higher met metabolic rates than the average person who's going to have a higher metabolic rate than somebody whose muscles have all atrophied away. Um, oxygen consumption is pretty important. You have to burn fat, so that maybe involves a little bit of converting chemical energy of food into energy that gets stored in our bodies one way or another. And the process that we do that with is oxidation. So I guess the statistic that I found in your one of the textbooks was that you get about 20 kilojoules per liter of oxygen consumed via oxidation. That is to say, you're getting this energy from oxidation, and the oxygen that you're getting is what's going into this. And so for every liter of oxygen you consume, you get about 20 kilojoules worth of energy out from the oxidation process. So the good news is that even when we're sitting around doing nothing, even when we're at rest, we are using some energy. And the rate at which this is happening at rest is sometimes called the basal metabolic rate. And so I found that a typical rate, 0.45 kilocalories per hour per pound, which breaks down to about 4,100 joules per hour per kilogram. And if you don't use all the energy then 39 kilojoules per gram is fat. So your textbook, the OpenStax textbook that is, actually lists metabolic rates for a variety of activities. And it actually is gives us what the energy consumption is and then also what the oxygen consumption is in liters per minute. So even when you're not doing much, you're just sleeping, you get 83 watts of energy consumption. That's to keep your heart beating and keep your body temperature up and so on. If you show up to class every day and sit in class and just listen, turns out you actually use 210 watts. So you use more than when you're just sleeping or resting. And if you walked to class, then you used up another 280 watts during your walk. If you biked to class from off campus, you get a 400 watts. And if you're late for class, you can sprint to class and you use 2,415 watts. And of course, these are all metabolic rates that are assuming a sort of average 76 kilogram male. If you're um, heavier, more muscular, a woman, then all these rates are going to change. So let's look at a couple examples for this. Uh, how much energy does a typical person burn while sleeping? So let's assume eight hours of sleep. And um, by typical person, I mean the person that's that 76 kilogram typical average male that is shown in that chart on the previous page. All right, so the energy used 
should be the average power times the time. So how much average power was this typical person using sleeping? Well, that chart said 83 watt. See, sleeping energy consumption watts, 83. So this is the number we use for our power. So we have 83 watts times 8 hours times 3,600 seconds per hour. Because remember that a watt is a joule per second. So that means that the sleeping person ends up using a total energy of, calculator please, 83 times 8 times 3,600, whoops, that's 600, 3,600, this much energy, 2,390,400 joules. So, 2,390,000 joules, or probably should actually round it to two significant figures, about 2.4 megajoules. Um, you can also calculate how many calories that is. Remember that the conversion rate is one calorie is 4,184 joules. Uh, sorry, one kilocalorie is, is 4,184 joules. The reason why a kilocalorie is so important is that a kilocalorie is also defined as being the food calorie. And so this amount of energy that we've just burned while sleeping, we can now divide by 4,184, and we see that we need 571 food calories per day just if we slept all day. So uh, energy for sleeping, 571 food calories. All right, so what happens if we do something else? Specifically, let's say that uh, you go to Moe's. Moe's is a great place to eat, very good food. But you decide to get the loaded down nacho platter. And it turns out that this loaded nacho platter, if you load it down with the sour cream and the uh, melted cheese queso, and you get the grounded beef, and you get the shredded cheese, and the... I don't want to make you guys too hungry who are listening to this, but you know, you get the works on it. It turns out that you're going to get about 10,000 kilojoules worth of energy in that nacho platter. So the question is, uh, how much time are you going to have to walk at five kilometers per hour to burn off this nacho platter. All right, well, again, what we need to have is a change in energy, which is equal to power times time. And now we're just gonna solve it for the time. Time is delta E over P. The delta E we already have is 10,000 kilojoules, which is the same thing as 10 million joules. And now we need to get the power, which we get off of this table from our notes. So walking at five kilometers per hour, looks like it does 280 watts. So if we walked, you'd get 280 watts of power use. So divide out the 280 watts. So calculator, please. That's 10 uh, million. There's three zeros. There's three zeros. There's the two zeros. Divide that by 280. And this gives us 35,714 seconds.
So we would need to spend a total time of 35,714 seconds walking. Uh, recall that one hour is 3,600 seconds. So if we take this time and we divide it by 3,600, we've got the number of hours that we're going to spend walking, 9.92 .9 hours. All right, so I went ahead and did this calculation because our next example asks, how far is this guy going to need to walk to burn off all the calories from eating this diet of one uh, platter of nachos per Saturday times one Saturday per weekend over the entire summer? Uh, now, granted, here at Troy, a lot of the time Mo's is closed on Saturday, so this may not be an issue, but maybe you do this once every Thursday or something. All right, so you eat this diet 10 times. How far are you going to need to walk? All right, well, we've already established that you need to walk about 9.92 .9 hours for one nacho platter. And we're going to do this times 10. So that means that you need 99.2 hours for two, uh, excuse me, for 10 nacho platters. And so this walking, recall, he was doing a speed of five kilometers per hour. And so we need to multiply basically to get the delta x. So delta x is going to be v delta t. So that's five kilometers per hour. And then that's times 99.2 hours. So multiply by 10, multiply by 5, and we get 496 kilometers, which given that this is only maybe two significant figures, we get approximately 500 kilometers. So you got to walk 500 kilometers to burn off all of those calories. But of course, as we know, it's it's not easy to get into Moe's during the summer semester on a Saturday. I'm not sure whether it's open on our campus during the regular semester, but presumably it is open a little more often. So suppose you did this during the regular semester of 16 weeks. Well, in that case, you'd have a delta x for 16 weeks. Uh, that's 1.6 times as far. So that times 500 kilometers, and that gets you 800 kilometers. Ah, but wait, 1.6 kilometers is also equal to one mile. Uh, so this means that your total distance walked, if you did this during the regular semester, would be 500 miles. So I guess if you were to eat this nachos for lunch once a week during the semester, you would in fact need to walk 500 miles. I think that the conclusion for this, of course, is that you would make these two fellows very proud of you. But I would walk 500 miles and I would walk 500 more That's all I've got for today, so thanks for watching, and um, as always, I need to give a little bit of credit where credit is due, so hope you've enjoyed today's video, and um, yeah, thanks for watching.
But I'm